Dong. How are you? Yeah, Bruce is now doing the second panel. Okay. Do you want Bob up here sitting in front of him? We're, uh, we're, we're working on surprise. Okay. So this is Mark 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 Mark
microphone. Good afternoon. My name is Greg Costello. I'm the executive director of Wildlands Network. And on behalf of my organization and the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, the Endangered Species Coalition, the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, National Parks Conservation Association, Defenders of Wildness, uh, Wildlife, excuse me, the Wilderness Society, Sierra Club, and Animal Welfare Institute, Appalachian Trail Conservancy, uh, we thank you all for coming today. And of course, we also thank our congressional hosts, Congressman Beyer, Senator Udall, Senator Whitehouse, and Representatives Grijalva, Eshu, Lowenthal, Huffman, and Dingle. Uh, thank you all for your support and for making this event possible. I'm not going to uh, take up much time with remarks right now. Uh, we are going to, we have an incredible cast of speakers uh, that we hope will inspire and inform everyone here today. I am going to turn over uh, for the first panel. Our MC for this event is Robert G. Stanton. Mr. Stanton served as the Senior Advisory to the Secretary of Interior from 2010 to 2014 and Director of the National Park Service from 1997 to 2001. He was the first African American to serve as Director of the National Park Service. He currently serves on the Advisory Council of the Council on Historic Preservation. And beginning with his appointment by Secretary of Interior Stuart Udall in 1962, he started his career as a National Park Service Ranger at Grand Teton National Park. He has dedicated his life to improving the preservation and management of the nation's rich cultural and natural resources, his bipartisan approach and to problem solving and cooperative resource management and stewardship has earned him respect and admiration everywhere he has gone. Under his leadership, the Park Service initiated several new programs, including the Public Lands Corps, Save America's Treasures Program, and added 11 new park areas and six national heritage areas. Please join me in welcoming a remarkable public servant, Robert Stanton. Ladies and gentlemen, friends all, and a special and my warmest greeting to the young people who honor us with their presence here today. I am truly honored and privileged to introduce our distinguished panel and our outstanding moderator, who will have a very uplifting, very constructive discussion with Dr. E. O. Wilson regarding wildlife corridors and protecting America's biodiversity. First, allow me to introduce Senator Tom Udall. Senator Udall began serving as a United States Senator in 2009 after two decades of public service as U.S. Representative and New Mexico State Attorney General. He was re-elected to the U.S. Senate in 2014 and is now New Mexico's senior 
Senate. Conservation is a Udall family tradition of which I know personally. Chairman Mo Udall and my first secretary, Stuart Lee Udall. Senator Udall has fought to enforce landmark environmental laws like the Clean Water Act and the National Environmental Protection Act. He has also authored and successfully passed the Sabaso, Sab Inso uh, Wilderness, which designated over 16,000 acres of New Mexico wilderness. He also founded the Congressional in International Conservation Caucus, which is now the second largest caucus in the U.S. Congress and certainly serves as a co-chair of the caucus in the Senate. Serving on five Senate committees, including appropriations, let me just underscore that, Senate committee including appropriations, <laughs> he continues to champion public lands and American wildlife. Most recently, Senator Udall led amendments to protect the Arctic refuge and defend our national parks, national wildlife refuge, national monuments, and other protected land and water in the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Tom Udall. Next distinguished leader is Congressman Don Biden, who is serving his second term as a U.S. Representative from Virginia's 8th District, representing Arlington, Alexandria, Falls Church, and parts of Fairfax County. He served as the Vice Ranking Member of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. He also served on the House Committee on Natural Resources and the Joint Economic Committee. He previously ran a successful Northern Virginia business for over 40 years. He served as President Obama's ambassador uh, to Switzerland. And he also served two years, I might add, as a lieutenant governor for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Representative Byer has been a leading champion for wildlife and wild places. Last year, he introduced the Wildlife Supporters Conservation Act and has led sponsorship of a bipartisan effort to create the Outdoor Recreation Economic Contribution Act. A member of the Bipartisan Climate Solution Caucus, he also chairs the Congressional Safe Climate Caucus, and he has been a champion of a strong Endangered Species Act. Ladies and gentlemen, from my adopted Commonwealth State of Virginia, Congressman Don Biden. <laughs> Absolutely needing no introduction, but having the great privilege to introduce you, I will take that liberty. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker, on the caucus, I mean on the panel, is the renowned biologist, America's leading steward of our natural resource heritage, Dr. E.O. Wilson. He is generally recognized as one of the leading scientists in the world. Dr. Wilson is acknowledged as the creator of a true scientific discipline, island biogeography and social biology. Three unifying concepts for science and humanity, jointly biophilia, biodiversity studies and consilium and one major technological advance in the studies of global biology, the encyclopedia of life. Among more than 100 awards he has received worldwide are the U.S. Medal of Science, the Proport Prize, which is equivalent to the Nobel Peace Prize for Ecology, and two Pulitzer Prizes in nonfiction. For his work in conservation, he has received the Gold Medal of the Worldwide Fund for Nature and the Audubon Medal of the Audubon Society. He is currently honorary curator in entomology and university research professor emeritus at Harvard University, chairman of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, board of advisors, and chairman of the Half Earth Council. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the men and women past and present of the National Park Service of American people, we personally want to thank Dr. Wilson for championing the natural resource challenge of the National Park Service. Ladies and gentlemen, our champion, Dr. E. O. Wilson. <laughs> and to lead, lead this discussion, we are certainly honored to have as the moderator, Ms. Andrea Seabrook. Ms. Seabrook is currently the managing editor, editor of Cannibal, the premier app and site for civic engagement an award-winning journalist with more than 15 years focusing on government and politics 
and the founder of the podcast, Decode DC. She previously hosted Weekend's All Things Considered on National Public Radio and has been featured on NPR, NPR Marketplace, The American Life, Radio Lab, BBC, CNN, B, PBS, and many, many other media outlets. She is indeed a star in her own right. Ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished moderator for this outstanding panel, Ms. Australia Beasley. I dress thank you. That's me. Hello, everyone. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm going to skip some niceties. I'm used to talking for, you know, hours on end. Talking. I'm good at that. Um, and I'm sure we all are. Um, I want to start by saying we are lucky beyond belief to not only have these leaders, scientific, political, policy-wise, here on the stage, but to have the audience that we have. I know many of you are leaders in your own right, in your organizations, and in the work that you are doing to bring together policy and civic action. So with that, we have a room full of brilliant minds. No pressure. It's all good. I want to I start by saying we know, we know two things, right? We know, I would venture to guess that everyone in this room knows the what, to some extent, what we have to do. No question. What we have to do. The how is a second part. And so often policy or politics and activism or science don't mesh enough. So the whole point of this panel is to figure out how we mesh the what with the how. So let me start with you, Dr. Wilson. It is a, such a pleasure to be with you again. Um, just in the last, just today, a GAO report came out, I'm sure many of you have seen it in your offices, saying that the United States is, just budget-wise, is already spending more mitigating climate change, uh, and especially disasters, resilience that come from those things, um, than ever before, projected to go much higher. Last week, we had a story about a massive decline in flying insects uh, in the air column. Uh, we also saw a report that showed that air pollution is actually overall more deadly than wars and famine uh, and other major problems we spend a lot of time on. So to me, this backs up the what. What must we do, Dr. Wilson, as fast as possible to do what you have been working on your entire career? Well, I think... Most people seated in this room uh, know about what the problems have been that have been the most obvious to our daily existence. Uh, we know the, very well the circumstances of climate change, and uh, there, uh, except for um, a few deniers whom uh, I believe evidence, common sense, and public pressure will eventually step aside. Uh, we know all this, but one other great crisis in the environment most people don't know about, and that is the growing threat of mass extinction of species. You've heard of it with particular species likely to be familiar uh, to uh, anyone approaches extinction or goes into extinction then it makes big news. But these are the, an the animals, uh, the star of the big show. And um, what's not known is a huge number of species of other kinds going extinct. And that is what we have to be focusing on, and it can be stopped. And that's why I'm here today in Washington with my group and why we held yesterday what I think is a potentially historic uh, event uh, at the National Geographic Society, which has uh, joined us, the Wilson Foundation, uh, as partners, giving us a very much better chance of pointing out 
in easily understood terms, the magnitude of the second crisis, mass extinction of biodiversity. So without at the risk of getting a little long-winded, let me just list the key facts, and then we can take it from there. How many species are there in the world? We know a little more, and given the scientific name, and a very, in most cases, sparse description of a little more than six million species of all kinds of organisms, all from big mammals all the way down to nematode worms and, and, and bacteria and so on. A little more than two million. How many species of organisms are there on this planet overall? The best estimates put it at 10 million. This means that 80% of the species are unknown. And we, we are trying to uh, find the un uh, locate the unknowns and get them into the overall census. Next question. How fast are these species going extinct? extinct? Known and th thus by extension unknown. And the rate of extinction now ongoing is somewhere between 100 and 1,000 times faster than it was when humans, before humans, came and spread around the world. Uh, and that appears to be accelerating. Just to take a quick example, the freshwater fishes of North America, well, United States, actually, uh, the freshwater fishes of the United States, between 1895 and now, uh, have uh, been going extinct at 900 times faster than before the coming of humans. So wherever we look, wherever we can take a measure, we find that it's declining. And uh, the news that insects, biomass, the numbers of flying insects, uh, that have uh, been descending precipitously uh, is now common knowledge. And now uh, we ask, what can we do about it? Uh, yesterday at the National Academy of, I'm sorry, the National Geographical Society, uh, representatives, mostly the scientists, from organizations in the United States and from Europe a few places in Europe, gathered in order to come to an agreement on what we can do about it. And the pivotal idea or concept that has now taken hold within the global conservation community, shared by, I believe, most American organizations, uh, is called the Half-Earth Solution. And um, I don't know how to introduce this without seeming to brag. Oh, my God, you have earned the right, my okay. friend. Oh, wait a minute. So I'm going to brag uh, in the northern as opposed to a southern mean. Uh, in the, um, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to brag in the southern rather than northern. And what we, when we brag, we like to brag most of all when we're telling a story. Okay, so this is the story. Uh, I published this book, Half Earth, last year. And uh, then, a few months later, I attended uh, the quadrennial meeting of the conservation organizations of the world, mostly organized under the International Union for the Conservation of Nature in Honolulu. I expected enough people to have read it to meet me when I gave a couple of talks, uh, with consternation and, and severe objections uh, for the idea that I was putting out. I said, the theory of island biogeography, which is, we now have tested pretty well, it works. Um, and I won't bore you with the formula and all that, except to say that it predicts that if we set aside one half of the earth or a given island or your backyard or the ecosystem of bacteria in your upper and 
intestines, wherever it is, uh, if we reduce that by one half, uh, then the um, number of species living on it sustainably will slide down to 85, but only 85. One half in going the other way added on uh, to protected land or wherever uh, result in 85% of the species existing in the entire system getting a reasonable um, protection. And that's a remarkable fact that's been worked out, but we haven't made use of it. So in half Earth, what I suggested, let's set aside half the land and half the sea in the world and see if it does protect that much. And um, to my astonishment, uh, this was greeted with pleasure by scientists and leaders of the conservation organizations gathered in Honolulu last year. And it has since taken off. It's become something of the lodestar of the global conservation movement. Now uh, we come to the problem of how. And that is, what, how can we make this work? Because if we could make it work, and it really does pan out, and it will, uh, then uh, we would have made an uh, enormous step in, in uh, global conservation, both on the land and in the sea. So that's where we are now, how to do that, and uh, what steps to take. And I won't go into them, except to say one more thing. You remember when I just started, I mentioned that we know worldwide uh, two million species. And that's the great majority of vertebrates, mm -hmm. birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, fishes. But when you get it down to the smaller creatures, that nonetheless have the similarly important roles to play in the ecosystems and the maintenance of living, the living world as the big guys, uh, then uh, we uh, would expect that they would follow the same rules and yet we don't know what most of them are, even here in the United States. Uh, we slowed down the process of censusing and studying each one of the species uh, in the mid 20th century with the advent of molecular biology, with the advent of uh, the structure of DNA. And this has been the golden age of biology. I would say the second half of the 20th century. But in the process, we just sort of forgot about taking the census and worrying about species diversity and the variety of life which sustains the living environment that we intimately depend upon. Uh, now we are setting about, or we hope to set about, what I call a Linnaean or biodiversity renaissance. That is to move back now uh, to the level of support and activity, mainly in museums and places that have collections and so on, uh, but anywhere in the world now for so, because we can communicate so much information out and into museums while we're sitting in a camp in Borneo. Uh, and, and therefore the whole thing can be speeded up in ways never dreamed of 100 years ago. So that is one of the major things we can do to stop species, the species extinction crisis, biodiversity crisis. Uh, and at that, at that point, I can just leave it for the moment by saying that um, we are, the scientists who gathered yesterday at uh, the National Geographic Society came in general agreement on how to achieve this how we could, we're mapping the world in a way to pick those areas that have large numbers of species all the way down to, to the little people, the, what I like to call the things that run the world. <laughs> uh, and uh, we are also considering the steps to take to bring about the biodiversity or the Linnaean Renaissance and find out what is there. If you think that it's unusual and newsworthy for a new species to be described, uh, then you and you, we report them as news, 
then you'd better have the New York Times or the Washington Post uh, delivered with the news uh, in the uh, about that thick every day. Um, it's going to be a revolution, but it's a revolution that gives hope. That's uh, we need to return to science, and this is going to be science of the first class, uh, to both map the Earth and find the ways to um, make managed areas and outright reserves, and plot, plot them and, and recommend them uh, without abrogating personal rights of people who own land and so on and on. Uh, find the way to do that. It'll be science first, then it's, it'll be very much politics, and then census what it is that we're saving species by species, getting enormous amounts of science, valuable scientific information as we do it to complete the census so that we know what the environment truly is. Now we are very ignorant. There are next. There are things we can do. I know the Congress uh, is seriously considering bills before or before us or before the Congress uh, to take steps uh, in the even in the countercurrent of trends in the current mm -hmm. uh, executive uh, administration uh, to uh, begin taking steps that will make it possible to uh, preserve the largest possible number of species uh, and then le make it possible to go on to the next step, which is opening uh, uh, the, uh, the preserved land and then holding on to the, the great majority of species. And that is why this is not a political speech it is one from science. Mm. Uh, I'm an ardent supporter of the, I believe it's called, the National Corridor Conservation Act I, uh, by uh, Representative By Byer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll mention that specifically because it is the best thing I've seen personally in the area of, of conservation and what it means to the science of conservation we've come across. Uh, and that is a step. It will, uh, I mean an important step, it will lead, uh, add land where it is most needed for conservation all through the country. And it won't be massive amounts. I don't think they'll be running into much problem there. But it will create a network yeah. of uh, land which even if even narrow, even if these corridors are quite narrow, a network in which organisms can spread by uh, by reproducing and and being carried or uh, walking and flying through, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that would radically change the situation America's in right now, vis-a-vis -vis climate change, uh, because this uh, whereas we're focused for the time mostly on polar bears being pushed south uh, and a very few other organisms and not many, a great amount of biodiversity in the Arctic. But then as, as the temperature and, and the attendant uh, patterns of fire and, and mm -hmm. storm or lack of rainwater, whatever, proceed on uh, <clears throat> uh, through the United States, then uh, this would allow us to um, uh, allow life in the United States and the biodiversity of this country uh, to move with it. And, and therefore, it's the first great step forward. I think of it like uh, Waze. Have you ever used Waze um, in your car, um, the app? I think about it as Waze of biodiversity, um, creating that map. Um, one of the fascinating parts of um, this prediction from Island Biogeography that, you know, losing half of the area of a system only diminishes species by 85 percent is that it, it hooks into what I understand. I am not. Diminishes by 15. 15. It loses 15. It preserves 85. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, 
Here's your mic. Oh, or if you save all of it, yes. uh, then uh, your saving say uh, half. Right. Otherwise, you would not be saving. Then you're, and you can do that over a broad area, or continent, and whatever. You're saving uh, 85 percent. It's a, it's a remarkable convergence of that idea with where the um, the uh, conservation community has come in this modern millennium, which is that the idea that we will, as I understand it anyway, that we will return the earth to wildness um, is, is not necessarily practical. That there are developing nations and developing communities that deserve to be able to develop maybe in much better ways, but that there is a kind of new wild there is a new standard by which we can at least staunch the flow, right? Well, that's true. We're losing, and we will continue to lose, what's left of wilderness. I hope not all of it. There will be enough, there's enough wilderness right now uh, to uh, meet the uh, one half uh, standard. But you know we're not gonna be able to hang on to it. And a lot of that wilderness that could be saved is, is uh, the North, uh, subarctic and mm -hmm. and coniferous forest wildernesses, and they really don't have much of the biodiversity compared to a rainforest. Uh, but part of the uh, evidence, in fact, we reviewed a lot of it yesterday, is that even in densely populated countries, uh, you can uh, develop, uh, and many have, small reserves. Uh, where a lot of the biodiversity hangs on. And these can be threaded together in their own kind of uh, channels. and With the and wildlife corridors, corridors yeah. concept, yes. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, no, it can be done. Uh, it'll actually, they're like, uh, this is when gerrymandering is the right thing to do. You know, where you are in a densely populated area, it can be, uh, what, uh, parts of India? Uh, it can be uh, in uh, uh, the northeastern United States, and they're just the right areas that we want, the kind of areas, and there may be just a few miles across, you know, or a few hundred miles of total area where this natural environment still exists, and pressure is coming in from all directions mm -hmm. to keep nibbling away at it. Uh, can, those can be connected with Zara Carters, and then also, uh, plan to be part of the reserves and the managed areas. We're, we're going to have to get a, a good name for these areas. We haven't invented one yet, and we'd love to hear recommendations. But well, they can be <laughs> threaded like a gerrymander, you know, to, to produce quite, quite, that chuck, quite, a, yeah. quite a large amount of area built yes. that way in a nice way. Senator Udall, um, I want to make sure that we um, suck the brain power out of you as well, or, um, or at least learn from it. Um, now we get to the how. Uh, we get to the point where we need experts like you who can tell all of us how to do what we know we have to do. Um, I know that you have been involved in, in um, many high-profile, important environmental uh, pieces of environmental legislation, the, uh, the, the chemical, um, the restructuring of the Chemical Act. Uh, the, we, we have to figure out how to bring in all kinds of lawmakers across the political spectrum, across the spectrum of uh, climate change understanding to not so much understanding. How do we do this, sir? Well, <clears throat> the first thing that I want to pay enormous respect to is Dr. Wilson, yes. because what he has done as a, as a world-renowned biologist is recognize what we need to do for life. And he's actually uh, started this discussion, as he said, in, in terms of scientists and all these major organizations and international organizations say, let's move in this direction. Let's have a vision. And, and people love a vision. They want it. They they love that vision, and I believe that that uh, 
uh, Dr. Wilson is doing is we talked over lunch something similar to what Jack Kennedy did on the moonshot. Don went off to votes and he's going to join us back to a moonshot of saying we are going to go to the moon by that date. So he's given us this vision. So how do we get there is what I think you're asking me. And, and I just I, I want to pay respect to the why and the science because I think it's tremendously important. And we've, we've gotten away from the science and we need to get back there. But the issue on why, um, I, I first of all believe we need to change our mindset in terms of living, living beings and, and life on this planet. We have had for a long, long time a, a mindset that there's human beings and then there's nature. And, and we sometimes think, and I, I think most of the people in this crowd are, are the ones that believe that we're a part of nature, but, but the way we approach problems around the world is very different from that. The, the approach is, is conquering nature and not being a part of it. I think one of the great uh, conservationists said something when we We'll really take the big next step when we realize we're part of a community of all living creatures. And, and so we first need to, to have that mindset change. And, and you know, a lot of the folks here in the organizations here are doing the stuff on the ground, the education, uh, the policy work, and all of that to, to get us there, to, to get that change in mindset or completely of viewing this in a different way. And then the second thing we need in Washington, and Don knows this very well, and he's, he's got this great um, uh, piece of legislation on, on corridors, is we've got to get back to bipartisanship. All of us know that what has happened uh, in, in the last, since the 1960s and 70s, we've gotten way away from bipartisanship on the science and on the policy. And, and I just have to look back to my father's generation when, as, as Bob Stanton talked, he was Secretary of the Interior, and that's when we passed. You know, the country rallied. We had a new feeling about where we wanted to move as a modern society on the environment, and we said, we passed clean water, clean air, endangered species, toxic chemicals. I mean, uh, Richard Nixon, you know, as, as, uh, um, as kooky of a character he was, he signed... <laughs> He signed the law to put the EPA into existence. And so tremendous bipartisanship. And, and then what's happened is we've gotten away from that. Just a little bit of hope, because you mentioned, Andrea, the, the chemicals. I worked, uh, in, and this was signed uh, last summer uh, as President Obama was going out of office. We worked for three years uh, to do a toxic chemicals bill. Many of the na na uh, national groups said, this was the first big environmental um, bill in 25 years to, to deal with toxic chemicals in our environment, impacting in, uh, wildlife, impacting human beings. Um, it, it only got four votes against it in the House. It got zero votes against it in the Senate. President Obama signed it. Uh, it's a little like green tendril or a green shoot yes. showing that we have the ability to have that bipartisanship. And that's where uh, I think we need to go. And it's a, it's, a, it's a road where we need everybody here and the organizations that are represented all working on that. But until we, in the policy arena, in the politics arena, until we recapture that bipartisanship, uh, we're not going to get there. We're just not going to get there. Can I ask you for some, uh, uh, Congressman Beyer, I want to, of course, get to you, sir. Thank you for voting. We all appreciate I voted no. Oh, okay. <laughs> We wanted him to vote because his, his constituents <laughs> would throw him out. Otherwise, we well, need yeah. him here to pass this quarter. To <laughs> um, I want to see if I could get to very, I mean, this is a, this audience, this is not a normal audience. This is full of people who are on the ground doing the hard, real work here. Are there any tips that you can give us for how to do that kind of, I don't know if it's shuttle diplomacy, how do you, how do you build among the players out there? How do we build the will to pass something, to bring something up like the Wildlife Corridors Conservation Act? How do you how do, you do this, sir? Well, let me give you a two-part answer. Uh, the, yes, the, sir. the first part, which is maybe the less important, is the work that Tom and I need to do with our Republican peers. Um, Garrett Graves, for example, who's a Republican from 
Louisiana has agreed to co-sponsor the corridors oh, bill in the congratulations House. Congratulations, yeah. yeah. That is big news. Yeah. That, I can report that, right? I can. Yeah, yeah. I got to get a I signature. Can quote you? I mean, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It'll be better if we get his signature on the thing. But, but, but he said that he'll do it, and I trust him. And we need to build from that because I mean, it's 241 to 194 in the House right now. So we're not going to get anything done unless we have a significant number of Republicans, and not just you know the extra 30 to pass the bill because there have to be enough for a Paul Ryan to actually put the bill on the floor. And so a lot of our effort is showing that something like the Corridors Act, or, or the, the, I mean, Tom did a great job with the Toxic Chemicals Act, is to show that it's in the interest of all Americans to do this and to move forward. Uh, the second part is, is the part that you can do. So we get, I'm, I'm sure the center is more important than, than we are, but we'll get 150,000 emails this year and 300 handwritten letters um, and maybe 300 visits. But the visits are by far the most important part. Because when they come and they sit down in our little office and talk to us for 20 minutes, we can't help but be affected by it. So any chance you get to go talk to your senators and your, Repub your members, House members, especially if they're Republicans, can change their minds. Excellent. Excellent. Sir? Well, the, the other, I just want to go back on toxic chemicals is because people may think, well, what does that have to do with the greater environment, the, the greater ecosystems? Actually, one of our big partners on that was the National Wildlife Fe Federation. And why did they weigh in? Because they thought we were reaching the stage with chemicals going into our environment that it was impacting wildlife. And so you had them join us. And, and as we see, Don and I see in the major, um, in, in many of these major battles, whether it comes to wildlife corridors, uh, you have the, the hunters and the anglers and the people that are out there, the backpackers, all uniting yes. and pushing uh, to do these things because, one, they like to be out there and enjoy the things that they do in the out of door. Yes. I By the way, Andrea, the many NGOs represented here were helpful, too, because yeah. I kept getting reminders from lots of different groups about showing up today. Uh, <laughs> which is well, in some ways, it would be easier if, you know, this, the news about the air column uh, losing flying insects at a precipitous rate, it would be easier if the air column were filled with, you know, pandas and polar bears, right? <laughs> I mean, it would be kind of interesting anyway, but it would be, um, well, it would be easier. Like, how, how do we, well, yeah. Andrea, the, and I'd be interested in, in Dr. Wilson speaking to this. The other day, I was down here at our botanical uh, reserve here just off the hill, Botanical Conservancy, and they were talking about medicines and medicinal plants. And they said, you can trace back, I don't know what his number is, but the scientists, there's a, there's a variety here, 50% of the drugs today originated from a plant. And, and what he's telling us, with 8 million more species out there, there are many more kinds of drugs and medicinal uh, things to be discovered. And, and I hate to have to explain it like that to people, but I think we need to think of the best arguments. And so if you get rid of the 8 million that haven't been discovered because we destroy their habitat and we keep gobbling up habitat, what you end up doing is destroying things that could end up helping human life and get, giving us a better quality of life. And w what's your number on the, the, on the medicinal? Is it, well, that's, I mean, uh, it's, that's correct. It's at least half. Yeah. And we have not, well, you know, in a, on a planet where 80% of the species haven't even been discovered yet, much less studied for all their biological traits and what might be relevant to human welfare, uh, the, um, we have the possibilities of um, making major new discoveries on how ecosystems are put together. For young scientists, uh, ecosystem studies, uh, giving, uh, revealing the secrets, shall I call them, of how ecosystems are born, how they change through time, and how they reach equilibration so that they can go on without a great change represents major problems of basic science. And now, if I might use that as an entry, you yes. know, for young people to be thinking about, if I you want to do the equivalent, be engaged in something like 
the equivalent of the discovery of uh, DNA or whatever. Ecosystems is where it is. But I wanted to make one more suggestion. Yes, sir. I'm getting the, um, the five-minute wave. The, now the four-minute wave. Um, okay, may I just say this quickly? From, yes. Uh, uh, there would be... I will not interrupt you ever. No. I, I, don't, I don't care what the wave says. This is too important for you to interrupt. Yes, sir. This is... <laughs> Uh, the fire bill, if I might call it that, is the, the strong thing about this. It's good for the family. It's terrific for education of kids to be able to get into areas rather close by, closer than what we have now, in which uh, the, um, they can experience uh, real nature, understand a bit of what the science is in, in studying it, and letting, as I had the great privilege, the kids run free, uh, they will get interest and insights and excitement uh, that's going to make acquiring a scientific education, maybe a scientific career, vastly easier than otherwise. Well, it sounds like you've thought about this whole make a good argument thing a little bit. Yeah, I've thought about that yeah. a couple nights before okay. falling yeah. asleep. Yeah. <laughs> Congressman Byer, Senator Ude Hall, Dr. Wilson, thank you all so much for joining our panel. Um, I'm going to let the frantic waves win the day here for a moment, and I, we so appreciate it. Thank you all.